guys, I have a book review for you this afternoon. Um, this is a nonfiction book that I finished a while ago, and uh, the title of it is called Who Owns Antiquity? Museums and the Battle Over Our Ancient Heritage by James Cuno. And uh, here's the title, and uh, the picture on there, let me see if you can see it. The picture on there is uh, two Italian soldiers standing guard in front of the Iraq National Museum. And right here in the middle is, there we go, um, that is the, uh, the Nimrud Lamassu, which is uh, one of the uh, treasures of ancient Assyria. You might recognize the, the figure. Sort of a protective kind of deity. And this picture was taken right after the Iraq National Museum reopened in July of 2003, uh, right after Saddam uh, Hussein was taken out of power. So uh, a really appropriate picture for the theme of the book. Um, I'm still pretty uh, conspicuously ignorant of a lot of the subjects that this book talks about. Museum acquisitions, uh, museology in general, which is the, the study and the building of museums, and the debates concerning the appropriation and the reappropriation of, I guess, what you could call culturally significant objects. But they all fascinate, fascinate me nonetheless. Uh, James Cuno manages to cover all of these bases in his book, uh, which has a major question really resting at the center of it. And that question is, do modern states have the right to demand the return of objects that may be deemed to have cultural, aesthetic, or national value? And if they do, what reasons validate that demand? A couple of really interesting questions. Uh, Cuno's short answer is that states don't have this right at all. And he says that instead, he sees the rise of these cultural reappropriation laws, that these pieces of art need to be brought back to their home country, uh, there's sort of a way of shoring up nationalistic pretensions. And his argument seems to be strong, uh, again, to me, someone who is uh, not terribly familiar with the literature in this area. Two of his chapters are called The Turkish Question and The Chinese Question, and they examine uh, this claim in detail. For example, when the Ba'athists took control in Iraq in 1968, uh, the uh, they adopted strict laws of cultural appropriation in concert with their really virulently nationalist rhetoric. Uh, here's a quote from the book. Their intention was to create a national territorial consciousness resting upon the particular history of Iraq and equally significantly of what the regime or a powerful circle within it presented as the history of the Iraqi people. Um, Central to this effort was an official drive to foster archaeology as a way of making people aware and proud of their ancient past, including that of the pre-Islamic era. And at the same time, the party, the Baathist party, encouraged local folklore for the purpose of inspiring communities with a sense of internal Iraqi unity and em emphasizing Iraq's uniqueness among the nations of the world at large. In other words, uh, to put it much more shortly, uh, at least on the level of political propaganda, the purpose of these new, new laws was not to maintain and preserve ancient cultural artifacts, artistic artifacts, but rather as a kind of proxy for a relatively new country to build a sense of cultural and national identity. Uh, much the same thing happened to the young Turkey while trying to uh, survive the birth pangs of early Ataturkism, or Kemalism, and its uh, subsequent westernization under uh, Kemal Ataturk. Uh, here's another direct quote from the book to sort of sum up that idea. The emergence and the development of archaeology in Turkey took place under constraints that are deeply rooted in history. Confrontation between the traditional Islamic framework and the Western model the endeavor to survive as a non-Arabic nation in the Middle East while the empire was disintegrating, the hostile and occasionally humiliating attitude of Europeans, and growing nationalism have all been consequential in this development.
The pace that archaeology took in Turkey is much more related to the ideology of, of the modern republic than to the existing archaeological potential of the country. And that's a, a direct quote from uh, Mehmet Azdogan's article, Ideology and Archaeology in Turkey. Uh, in a similar way, um, the Elgin marbles served as political symbols, first and foremost, uh, critical to the identity and national spirit of the modern nation-state of Greece about 200 years ago, not just as artistic archaeological artifacts. The claim to national identity is also a pretty common one, and one that Kuno rejects with equal, equal fervor and passion. We're so used to the argument that this object or that object belongs here or there, in this or that country, because of the important part it plays in making a people who they are, or a nation what it is. However, these objects are so often removed in historical time, uh, so far in historical time, that a number of the things that these artists shared and this art shares with the supporters of cultural appropriation is really vanishingly small. And just for an example, you can look at uh, contemporary Egyptians. They share neither a common language or a body of customs or a religion or law with ancient Egyptians, yet we're still urged uh, in many places and in many uh, uh, sites in the media um, to believe that, you know, that these ancient Egyptian artifacts are integral to the identity of contemporary Egyptians. Presumably, one would imagine because of geological, uh, or excuse me, geographical proximity. Um, that dynamic thing that we call culture, though, has worked over dozens of centuries to produce widely divergent changes in ancient Egyptians and uh, contemporary Egypt. The claims of contemporary Egyptians on the cultural artifacts of ancient Egypt seems tenuous at best for this reason. The ever-presence of boundary crossings and the impermanence of cartography uh, both speak to the capriciousness that is that thing we call cultural identity. Kuno goes on to argue for what he calls partage, uh, which is the provision of archaeological and historical expertise in return for the partitioning of important discovered objects. So basically, I'll go over to your country to help you, um, you know, get or preserve or get out of the ground all of these objects, and in return, you give me a third or a half or whatever agreed upon uh, part of the loot. Uh, one of the only other alternatives, he would say, uh, if, if you don't engage in partage, which is the thing that's happening now, which is the um, explosion of a black market, uh, which in which case these these objects would certainly lack the uh, curatorial and historical expertise that they would be lavished if they were actually in a proper museum setting. Kuno effectively cottons on to an important lesson of the last few centuries, that the modern nation-state will stop at nothing to traduce any obstacle that gets in its way of uh, imparting its own influence. And he does go out of his way to paint many of these states. Um, like I said, China, he talks about Egypt, he talks about Turkey. Um, he paints these states as heterogeneous and uniform in their power and in their willingness to exert it, which is a little misleading at best. Not all beginning nations practiced nationalism, uh, neither on an ideological or a practical or pragmatic level, uh, and neither did they do so with equal vim and vigor. As convincing as Kuno's arguments were, I often found myself reversing the cultural tables and asking myself what I would do if for whatever counterfactual historical reason, an original copy of the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution had found its way into the halls of the Kremlin or the Forbidden City. Could Americans who argue against cultural reappropriation, those Americans like James Cuno himself, uh, could they really have the intellectual courage and integrity to say with a straight face 
that it doesn't matter that these objects are not permanently housed in the United States. Then again, we are much closer in historical time and in language and culture and heritage and mores and all of that good stuff to the people that actually created this country. Uh, much closer, say, for example, than the, the artisans of the Shang era who created Shang era pottery are to contemporary Chinese people. But in, uh, you, that closeness is also uh, important, but I wonder if it's actually uh, important enough to change someone's mind. Um, actually, and the same thing goes with uh, uh, those wonderful artists who created the Elgin marbles. You know, they're, they're much, much more removed in time uh, uh, in relation to contemporary Greeks than we are to the founding fathers and mothers. And that might complicate an already very intricate argument, but it is something to think about. And whatever your opinion on these issues, provided you had one uh, prior to the exposure to this book or to my review, it'll make you rethink about, it'll make you rethink of how art and identity and ideas behind cultural reappropriation and museum building are all really, really linked together and interrelated. Um, it does a wonderful job at raising really smart questions about how all of these concepts are uh, interlinked. Hope you enjoyed the review, and if any of it sounds interesting, check it out. James Cuno's Who Owns Antiquity? Museums in the Battle Over Our Ancient Heritage.